for him. And uh, another partner that I have the pleasure to introduce to you, uh, many for the first time, but I'm pleased to let you know that uh, Craig uh, has been partnering in a way with us here at Mac for over two years now. Uh, he's been my ministry coach since I've arrived here at Mac and it's been a wonderful support and encouragement to me. And uh, so it's really exciting to introduce you. Come on up, Craig. Let's give a round of applause. I've got this, I think. This is working. Okay. Yep. All right, then. Uh, I thought it'd be great for us to get to know Craig a little bit. So uh, let's say we all came to either your house in Kellyville. No, no, it's Terry Hill. Terry Hill, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I don't know either one. So an hour away. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Both Terry Hills yeah. or you can pick. Or we came into Newtown to visit you at Moore College where you work. Yep, yep. Um, and you were going to take us out to lunch. Yep. Which venue, like as in Terry Hills or Newtown, and where are you going to take us? Uh, if I was cultured, I'd say Newtown, wouldn't I? But I'm not cultured. Okay. Yeah, so I'm a bit of a homebody. So I take you to Terry Hills and I have a cafe that I go to. It's attached to a flower market called Taste Buds. And I go there all the time. And my wife always says, someone saw you at Taste Buds again. You've got to stop spending our money. <laughs> <laughs> Every day. Okay. Much. Well, yeah. we know where yeah. to track you down. That's That'll right. Be, uh, That's right. Uh, great. Okay. Now, we're in Terry Hills. Uh, obviously, it's not just going to be all of us coming. It's going to be your family. Tell us a little bit about your family. Yeah, yeah. So married to Sam for, uh, got to get this right, haven't I? Um, 20, coming up to 22 years. Woohoo! So we're going away the day for a family holiday the day after our anniversary, so it'll be 22 years. Uh, and I've got two boys. Will is 11, he's in year six, and Josh is 10, he's in year five. And um, now that's saying about cats and dogs, that's my boys. Yep. <laughs> Very different. Uh, they argue a lot, but I love them to bits, and they're good kids. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, because Craig's, uh, sadly, a, a massive cricket tragic. <laughs> was. Oh, was. Was. Oh, you don't like it anymore? Well, no, 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 I still did. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> a present bit answered. <laughs> anyway, um, if you had to kind of pick your family to be one sport, like that would best capture your family, yeah, yeah. which sport would it be? Yeah, I probably should say boxing after what I said before. But, <laughs> um, what sport would it be? Uh, I would say body surfing. There you go. We, we all love doing it and we right. live near the beach. So body surfing, why? I can't answer that because I didn't know this question was coming. But <laughs> we love body surfing. We love going to the beach. Cool. Yep, yep. All right. My last question is: Fast forward to over lunch. Yep. Um, you're sitting there enjoying some delicious food and, and great fellowship. Yep. Job's done. What is the one thing that you hope we're all talking about oh, and yes. taking away with us from yep. today? Yep. Well, it's, I'm stealing a bit of the thunder from what I was going to say at the start of the talk, but. I hope that you feel convicted and capable of praying for two and that you feel convicted that you can do this together as a team. That's where we want to be by the end of today and Brilliant. I think we can get there. Yep. Thank you. I won't steal any more of okay. your thunder. Okay. We're looking forward to hearing from Thanks, you. Thanks, mate. Thanks. Me Was there Bible readings now? Bible readings? The Bible readings are on your sheet. The sheet I've got in front of me might just be a word or two different. Um, it comes out of an earlier version of the NIV. <clears throat> so the first reading is from Matthew 9. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. <clears throat> and from Matthew 28, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and 
teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And from Revelation. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. Thank you, Clara. I might just move this. Is that okay if I pop that mic? Good work. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Rob and staff. It's, it's really great to be here. So my, my role, I work for the Centre for Ministry Development, which is part of Moore College, uh, or a centre of Moore College. And so we work with pastors trying to equip them and uh, lay leadership in churches, uh, trying, to, trying to equip and help and support pastors. It's one of the hardest jobs in the world. I think there was a, a survey that was done recently that said, second to being president of the United States, uh, the most difficult job was to be a senior pastor in a church or a senior minister in a church. Doesn't say much for being prime minister of other countries, does it? Uh, but it is a really tough job. The role of a pastor is this, and for most guys, the skill set is this. And so there's a whole lot of support that's needed. And as Rob mentioned before, I've got to know Rob over the last couple of years. It's been my joy to get to know uh, you through him, know a bit about this church, um, and just to see as well, to encourage you to see Rob's prayerfulness and discipline um, and his heart for you all has been a great joy for me. I love your mission and your vision, Alive with Christ. You can see it on these banners behind me. Uh, it's a terrific vision. We're going to talk a bit more about that today. Let me just put this up a little bit. There we go. So where are we headed today? Well, if we're, if we're going to see people come alive with Christ and grow in our convictions and commitment to sharing Christ, then we need to be really clear on what the New Testament says about what a disciple is, why we make disciples, and how disciples are made. And as we talked about before, I hope by that, the time we finish today, we're really clear on those three things, what a disciple is, why we make them, and how, how they're made. And I hope you leave feeling convicted and excited about what God might do through you, the people of Mac, if, if you and your friends and the whole church commit to prayer for two. And I hope you leave feeling like you've developed just a little bit of an action plan for, for how to put that into practice. We just heard the Bible read and thank you for, for that reading. You can see that on your workbook. You'll see your workbook there. Uh, if you've got a pen, that would be great. The, the reading are on the front, so you can keep referring back to those. There are a whole lot more verses which we won't get time to unpack uh, today, but I want to encourage you to go back later on 
as you're reflecting on your notes. Just have a look at some of those verses uh, in line with those, those three main points that we're going to be looking at. Those three passages we just heard, that the, uh, the Lord of the harvest, to send out workers into the harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And then the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. And then the glorious outcome that we just read before, Revelation 7, uh, when we see the, the saints gathered around the throne. Later on, probably not in this session, probably at the start of the next session, we'll have some question time, some Q&A. So if you want to uh, write some questions down, things that come to mind, or make some comments, preferably not throw fruit, but just make some comments or ask some questions, I'd encourage you to do that later on. Where do I point this? Sorry, mate. Wherever. <laughs> there we go. Why make disciples? You're at the top of page two in your notes. In Matthew 28, we read just before Jesus ascended into heaven on that mountaintop in Galilee, he delivers his parting words. If you had one chance to deliver your final words to a loved one, I reckon you'd want to make it count. I reckon you would want it to be meaningful and to be about the most important thing to you. Last words can be so powerful and they often reveal what someone holds most dear. Here's a couple of last words, reportedly, I can't confirm, I wasn't there, but here's reportedly some last words for some famous people. Leonardo da Vinci, who was most famous for painting the Mona Lisa, possibly the best known painting in the world. He is said to have said, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. Now I've seen the Mona Lisa in the flesh, I reckon he's justified in having those feelings. I queued for about an hour and it's really not that flash. <laughs> Beethoven, the deaf composer who wrote some of the greatest musical compositions in history, he said, I will hear in heaven the longing of the heart to hear his compositions, to hear, just to hear. I think this is my favourite though, famous British comedian Spike Milligan, he went for one final laugh with his last message inscribed on his, on his tombstone, I can see that some of you know it. And it read, I told you I was ill. <laughs> Je Jesus made his final words count before he ascended into heaven on that mountain in Galilee. His words are very intentional, they're profound, and they're direct. They are words not just given to the eleven on that mountain, they are words that are intended to shape the life and priorities of all those who claim to be his. They're words that are to shape your life. They, they must profoundly shape the life of every Christian. So for the last few years, before his disciples have been, they've been hanging on his every word and marvelling at him. And they've seen his, his incompa uh, incomparable power, his power over creation to calm the storm, his power over the spiritual world to send demons out of the, of the demon-possessed man and into the pigs as they run down into the lake. The power of his word to move someone from death to life. Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out of the tomb. He was dead and made alive through his word. The power to forgive sin. We just heard Mike talk before about the, the paralytic lowered through the roof who wanted to be healed and was told your sins are forgiven. And these disciples who are gathered on that mountain, they've seen him betrayed and crucified and then raised to life. And now these 11 who he personally has invested in, they've been summoned to that mountaintop. And in verse 18, he delivers his parting words. You can see there on the front of your worksheet. All authority in verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's the climactic commission. It's the all-encompassing vision of what God is doing in this age prior to Jesus' return. Did you notice there's no half measures there? Have a look. Verse 18. He has all authority. Verse 19. You make disciples of all nations. Or in the, in the Greek manuscript, as you go, make disciples of all people. 
including the Southern Highlands. We teach them to obey everything or all he has commanded you. And he's not just with us sometimes, verse 20, he is with us always, always, as you're praying for your friend, as you're summoning the courage to perhaps share or invite. He is with you always to the very end of the age. All authority, make disciples of all people, obey all he's commanded, he is with us always. That's the command. Let's see how the story ends in Revelation 7, 9 to 17, just lower down on that front page. I hate it when people spoil movies, but I reckon this is the best spoiler alert in history. You get to see the end product of people being made alive in Christ. You get to see the fruit of your prayers, the fruit of your training, the fruit of your courage in getting out of your comfort zone, the fruit of your boldness, and the fruit of your persistence and your teamwork. This spoiler alert shows us that the forces that rebel against God will be defeated. We get to see the end. He will rightfully rule from his th- throne and make all things new. You see in that passage, the Apostle John catches sight of a numberless multitude from every nation, every people group as we talked about. From Asia, from Africa, from the Americas, from Europe, from Australia and the saints of Mittagong Anglican Church, all gathered around the throne before the crucified and risen Christ, who's pictured as the Lamb. And this multitude are in pure white robes that have been made white. How? By being washed with blood. Now, my son a little while ago had a bleeding nose on his new white sheets. I just happened to be white sheets that were put on that day, of course. And it didn't make them whiter. This blood is special. This blood is unique. It's beautiful imagery. The multitude cry out in salvation, in celebration, I should say. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, we just sang together and it was great. It was stirring. I hope you've experienced, I hope you experience the joy of that each week. I hope you've experienced the joy of being in a, in a convention when thousands of people are gathered, like they do at Katoomba, to sing. And sometimes they turn the that they stop playing the instruments and you just get to hear the voices. It is stirring. It's unifying. And I think in those moments, it's like peeking through the curtain to the day John is talking about here in this passage. The numberless multitude rejoicing, celebrating something infinitely better than winning lottery, infinitely better than your favourite sporting team winning a premiership or your kids achieving success in the world, or the relationship you long for, or living in a comfortable house in the highlands, or even being surrounded by family and friends who you love, or having the freedom to do as you please as a retiree. All these things can be good things, blessings from God even, but they're not in the same stratosphere as this picture here. They don't even come close. This multitude are celebrating and it cannot be topped by anything. Jesus reigns on the throne and the toil and the frustration and the ravages of sin and your earthly life, gone in an instant. Hunger, gone. Thirst, gone. Scorching heat, gone. Suffering, gone. Suffering, gone. Verse 15, he says, he shelters them with his presence. Verse 17, he shepherds them, he leads them, and he wipes every tear from their eyes. If you can have a favourite verse, my favourite verse in the Bible is Revelation 21.4. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. No more. What a day that will be. The Gospel of John 14.6, many of you will know it well, tells us that there is only one way to experience this day. Only one way, and that is through Christ. This is the joy that awaits those who go the distance in trusting Christ. So why make disciples? You see in your workbook there on page 2. We make disciples because God's goal for the whole world 
and the whole of human history is to glorify his beloved son in the midst of the people he has rescued and transformed. The people in this room here and the people out there who are not yet in this room. But with prayer for two, we are praying that they will be. We could just make disciples because Jesus tells us to, you know, adopt the Nike slogan, just do it. Scripture tells us to, to go and so get on with it. And for some people that's enough. But God in his kindness has revealed so much more about the necessity, about the privilege, the joy and the desperate urgency which we sometimes lose sight of in making disciples. Colossians 1 says, Colossians 1 God has a history-wide plan, a worldwide plan to redeem everything to himself. It was created by him and it was created for him. You have breath in your body for him. And he gives it to us, not just for our leisure or entertainment, but for him. Colossians 1, 3, 13 to 14 says, For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, I'm one of the 65% um, of people that research suggests are visual learners. This diagram I'm about to show, I think it's a helpful visual representation of what is taking place when someone is rescued from their sin. And we'll build on it a bit as we go through this talk. What is a disciple? You can see there, on one side of the cross... They're in the domain of darkness. We just read about it in Colossians then. And on the other side of the cross, cross when they've confessed and repented and turned to Christ, they're in the kingdom of the Son. There is no other kingdom. There is no other domain. There are two. There's no kingdom of self-actualization. There's no kingdom of just happiness. There's a domain of darkness and a kingdom of the Son. I think historically we've been susceptible to thinking that this world can be neutral territory. Tempted to think that, uh, you know, there's nice people getting on with their nice lives and sometimes as Christians we're to be the nicest of the nice people or nicest of the nice groups and that's what people will be attracted to. Author Tony Payne, uh, he says that, or said about 10 years ago that for us Christians, it's like the dimmer switch is turned up, the darkness doesn't seem so dark to us, and people don't seem so lost in it. I think when Tony wrote that 10 years ago, he was spot on. But I think there's a shift that's taking place at the moment. And I think COVID has contributed to that very significantly. I think things are changing. People are becoming more aware of how broken and dysfunctional and deceptive our world is. A world of confusion around gender and sexuality. A world of dishonesty of financial and political volatility, of government overreach, of wars and the threat of wars. I think people are starting to be more curious and open. I have a 60-year-old mate who I would have described as as far away from God as you could possibly be 12 months ago. And I was sitting with him, having a drink with him one day about 12 months ago, and he said to me, so, you know, you know I think what you believe is garbage. What is, what is a Jesus? What, what, is, what is Jesus? I, I, I've heard his name, but I don't really... I've really got no idea. He's lived in Sydney his whole life. No idea. That's how far back many people are. Yesterday, he sent me a Bible verse for my encouragement. He's not a Christian. But God is working in him. It's been quite amazing to see. He's sent me other things and other questions. God is working and moving. There's a, a curiosity in him as he looks at what's going on in the world. God wants us to pray and he wants us to go. Matthew 19, we read, he wants us to send out workers into the harvest and Matthew 28, to go. The people in your street are in the domain of darkness. The people in your school or workplace are in the domain of darkness. The people in your sports club or your cafe or at the shops, there are people in the domain of darkness. They have rejected Christ or ignored Christ's offer of forgiveness. 
the incredible grace that he offers them, that he's offered us. If they don't accept it, they are headed for hell. This is what the Bible says. So why do we want to make more and more disciples of Jesus? Because his goal for the whole world and the whole of human history is to glorify his beloved son in the midst of the people he's rescued and transformed. So what is a disciple? If we're going to make them, we need to know what they are. It's a, it's a word that can often be misused. And as you think of the word disciple now, many of you are probably thinking of the word follower, which is not necessarily a, a bad interpretation. But typically when I uh, talk about disciple and discipleship, people think about follower and followership. There is a sense in which we need to recover this word. The Greek word for disciple most often means learner. Elsewhere it's translated as student or pupil or apprentice. It's someone apprenticed to the teacher to learn from him, to learn to become like him. We see in this, in this slide a disciple is a Christ learner that there's, there's two people. We talked about the domain of darkness and the kingdom of the sun. And you can see the L plate there is, to, is denoting... Uh, denoting learner, okay, like a learner L plate on a car. We're all learners. We can learn Christ no matter where we are in that continuum, but we're all learning to become like the one we're learning. We're learning a person. That when I uh, was in America once, I gave a presentation like this and I showed the L plate. I don't have L plates there. And a guy came in late and he came up to me at the end and he said, thanks so much. I really like that L there. I never thought about it that way, but Christians really are losers, aren't they? That's why you shouldn't be late. Yeah. <clears throat> Becoming a learner of Christ, it requires a radical change. It requires transformation, a changed heart, a changed mind, changed actions through God's grace. Continuing to put off the old self and put on the new self. That's a lifetime thing. In God's strength, by the power of the Spirit. Putting off the old self, putting on the new we don't have time now, but many of Paul's uh, letters, the Apostle Paul's letters, urges us to be makers of disciples or learner makers. And he talks about the way they learned or are to learn Christ. You can look up some of those, those passages later. Our goal is to, make, to play our part in making learners step by step, over time, in as many contexts as possible. Here at church, in the home, in the world, at the truck stop, at school over coffee, everywhere. It's all, it's all God's. There's opportunities everywhere. Mac here is to be a Christ learning community, one that seeks to make learners of one another, to help one another, to do another part of your, your mission, to know Christ. Disciples are made tiny step by tiny step over time. Making learners is also about making new learners, new disciples who don't yet know Jesus. And so, sorry, I just come back to these verses which I think are key. A disciple is a Christ learner. We said uh, in Luke, we see this really clearly, a student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. As a learner disciple, you're learning a person and learning to become like that person. And in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples, Luke 14. Putting off the old self, putting on the new, giving up. So how are they made? Well, summarised in a literary process called the four Ps. Okay? Most things in Christian ministry uh, end up being alliterative. Okay? Proclamation of the word of God in multiple ways. Prayerful dependence on the spirit. People are God's fellow workers. Perseverance step by step. So what we want to do, you can see the bottom underneath this diagram, this step-by-step -step diagram, we want to help those around us take a step to the right or towards Christ, to knowing Christ, through the four Ps. Proclamation, prayerful dependence on the Spirit, people as God's fellow workers, perseverance step-by-step. -step. The first P there, proclamation, 
if we believe the Bible, we believe what 2 Timothy says, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is suitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God has breathed life into scripture. It is all suitable. God's word has power. If you are a Christian, his word continues to transform you through the power of his spirit. Hebrews says it's living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. That is sharp. It has the power of life, the power to create. We heard about that before. It will involve in some way speaking. And so often people say, you don't understand, I'm just not that sort of person. I'm not eloquent, I'm not particularly articulate, I'm not a speaker. Maybe. What I've learned over the years is that many, many, many more can than do. And sometimes it's a little bit of training, a lot of prayer, and some boldness and encouragement. But it's not just about speaking. It's not just about going to just the right verse and proclaiming just the right thing at just the right time. None of us can do do that. None of us. That's the work of God. But we can proclaim. How can we do it? Well, there's lots of different ways people can do it. They can write a card or a letter. Take their time. They can send an email or a social media message, a private message. We can send a text message. We can send a link to an article that we read that we found interesting or stimulating. We can give someone a Christian book. We can, we can, there's all sorts of things. The opportunities are endless. I've got a, a friend uh, in the US who says, in regards to proclamation, the only limitations are creativity and faithfulness. There's so many ways to do it. You don't have to be limited to speaking if you're not a confident speaker. Give it a go. God wants you to give it a go. But there are many ways. The New Testament does make it clear that... Uh, When we become Christians, the Spirit opens our mouths to confess. There's lots of verses there. The key is to pray and ask God for wisdom and to think, how can I proclaim in a way that will help this person take one tiny step towards being alive in Christ? It's not this interaction is about seeing them move from death to life. That may happen once in your life, maybe. Thousands of tiny little steps, a little gentle nudge in the small at the back, seeing people move forward, tiny step after tiny step. We know the Christian life is not, James tells us, not a beautifully linear trajectory of just continuing to move forward. You know that about yourself and your Christian life, and I know it about mine. Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, three steps back. Three steps forward, one step back. That's the the wrestle between the sin and the flesh. In terms of proclaiming, I want to tell you about a man called David. There we go. David is a man I still haven't met face to face, but he's a story of perseverance and making disciples via the four Ps. David, I, I just let you know, I always get emotional when I tell this story. It's very hard for me not to. But I, when I was uh, first married 22 years ago, I got diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, having had a few illnesses before that. And I was basically home, housebound for a couple of years and I couldn't work full time for seven years, six and a half years. It was a really, really difficult time, a difficult way to start a marriage. And after a couple of years, having been a professional athlete, to then going to be housebound for a couple of years, I was really struggling. I wanted to go into ministry. I wanted to go to more college. I had all these things that I was going to do for God. God needed to humble me. But I was struggling. And after a couple of years, I started thinking, is this worth it? I started to get the first thoughts of, I don't think I can do this anymore. I remember laying on the couch and my daily exercise was to go to the letterbox, which was about 50 metres away. I went to the letterbox and I got this letter and it was from this man, David. He was a friend of a friend and the friend had asked him to write to me to encourage me. See, David was born with all sorts of, all sorts of uh, physical disabilities. Uh, I think he had a cleft palate. He was blind in one eye, struggled with hearing. Uh, he married his wife and they had four children 
Two of them, I think, had cerebral palsy, one deaf, one blind. His life has been riddled with arthritis. He can't sit down or stand up for too long. He has to sleep at particular angles unless otherwise the pain gets too great. He hasn't been to church for 20 years, or he hadn't at this point. And he continues to pray, and I know that he prays for me every day now. He's helping me to grow through his prayers. But he wrote me a letter on that day, and it said, I want to encourage you to keep persevering. You see, Romans 8 says, God works in everything for the good of those who love him. And he told me his story, and I wept. I wept for a long time. I was overcome with emotion. David, I later found out, had to write that letter, could only type for 10 minutes a day. The pain was so great. And it took him two weeks to compose a two- or three-page letter. Such was his desire to encourage someone. <clears throat> to encourage someone he didn't know. If David is that committed to disciple making, <laughs> how much more me, how much more us? There are so many ways to encourage people to help them see that, take that next step. But it's his faithfulness in prayer, his commitment to prayer, that I find incredibly inspiring. And so the second P is prayerful dependence on the Spirit. I'll just go back. too far. Prayerful dependence on the Spirit, you'll see in the outline. In Luke chapter 18, the persistent widow, we know that story, she keeps persisting with the unjust judge, keeps asking and asking and asking, and in the end, he wears her out, or she wears him out, and he gives her what she asks, and Jesus says, how much more God? He encourages us to be persistent in prayer, to keep asking him, and to keep asking him, it's part of what refines us and grows us as disciples. There's perseverance involved in that as well. I want to tell you another story about prayer to encourage you. So I didn't grow up in a Christian family. My dad became a Christian before he died and the years before, and I praise God for that. But I didn't grow up in a Christian family, but I had three cousins, uh, girl cousins, who were Christian. We went to their place for a barbie, and uh, it was at Christchurch St. Ives as well, Dave, and they, and they invited me to a, a youth group. I was about 14 at the time and was like, oh, you're kidding. The last place on earth I would want to go is a church. And so anyway, my brothers and I, one of four boys, we went along to this church and my cousin Louisa said at the end of it, did you like that? Did you enjoy it? And I was like, oh, it's okay, yeah, good, thanks. And, and she said, would you like to come back again? I was like, really busy. Um, maybe, maybe sometime, yep. Um, and I think she asked maybe one, one or two more times down the track if I'd like to come back, but I didn't want to come back. Fast forward 10 years, I gave my testimony uh, at church and I was baptised and I invited uh, my cousins there and I said to her were you surprised when you heard I became a Christian? She said no I said you, you weren't but I, I knocked back going to church and she said oh, I could see something was there and I said so you weren't surprised she said Craig I've prayed for you every day for 10 years <clears throat> I'm not surprised that's the persistent widow, that's perseverance in prayer. I'm so indebted to her for her prayerfulness. Just before I wrap up this talk, I just want to ask you to take a minute to think of one person in your life who has not yet put their trust in Jesus. Just think about someone now. If you are struggling to think of someone, think of someone who's in your circle or you see on a week to week or a monthly basis, maybe a, a hairdresser or someone at the shops or what does that person enjoy or love doing? What makes them tick? What is it that drives them? Do you know what their experience with Christianity is? What their thoughts about Jesus are? If you had to think of one major thing that's a blockage to them, inquiring about Christianity or coming into this building, what's that blockage? Now imagine you've been praying for them for months, and not only have you been praying for them for months, 
but your friends here, two of your other friends have been committed to praying for them as well. In fact, the whole church has been working together to pray, not just for your friend, but for the friends and contacts and family members of everyone else in prayer for two. And we really have acted as our team and committed ourselves to prayer and action. And that person, 12 months from now, is sitting next to you and they're in this building. And they have moved from the domain of darkness in God's incredible kindness to the kingdom of the sun. What would that be like? It's hard to imagine for many of you, isn't it? It's hard to imagine that loved one, that person you care about so deeply, that actually happening. The Apostle Paul killed Christians. God opened his eyes. He can open the eyes of your friend or loved one too. The third P is disciples are made through uh, people as God's fellow workers. God in his kindness uses us. And the fourth P is persevering step by step. Christ learners are made patiently and perseveringly over time. It's not one giant leap usually, it's usually incremental steps. It's often a test of our faith, a test of our perseverance. And God uses our perseverance to transform us and to see others transformed. And he wants us to be patient in prayer like the persistent widow. So how are disciples made? Proclamation of the word in many and varied ways. Prayerful dependence on the spirit. People, us as God's fellow workers and perseverance step by step. In prayer for two, this fantastic initiative that you guys are taking up, those four Ps are at work. And they're at work with the hope of seeing people move step by step over time to share Christ so that they may know Christ, so that they may be alive with Christ. I'm so eager to see what God might do as this church unites together and commits to praying for two. I'll pray. Father, thank you that your word is powerful, that it opens the eyes of the blind, that it gives life, that it moves people from darkness to light, from death to life. Father, thank you for opening our eyes and your great kindness and mercy. We pray that you would open the eyes of those who we've just thought about. Only you can do that. You tell us that there are those who water and those who plant, but that you are the one who makes it grow. And so, Father, we pray that we would unite together, that you would convict us to be prayerful and that you would do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Chris, uh this, thank you. This is uh, what we're starting to be praying about. Because in us here, gathered here this morning, what was once dead is now alive. Uh, God gave to us the breath of life. He brought us up from the grave. What's the natural response? We burst out with songs of praise. This is what we want prayer for too, to embody for the whole community, the whole the highlands. That one day we can call them brothers and sisters in Christ and they might sing this with us. So let's stand and sing, Save My Soul. One way. 
There we go. There we go. I knew it was one way or the other. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Um, can I get some slaves to bring that up, please? <laughs> well, you know. Yeah. Oh, exactly. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. No, that's fine like that. Yeah, thank you. Great. Now, um, following on from that talk, I don't know if you had a chance to discuss those things over, over more. Oh, shoot. Before I go there, I just want to say I get to visit a lot of churches and to, hear, to be able to hear the voices of the congregation is super encouraging. That's what I could hear before with you. Hear you belting it out. So I'm not sure if that is... An every week thing, but it was really great to hear today. I could really hear the congregation um, encouraging one another and, and uh, praising God together, so that's great. Um, are there any questions or comments, challenges from the talk this morning? We did an awesome session. Anyone want to ask anything? It may come out later on, but if you've got a question you want to ask, feel free to go for it. Yeah. Yes, yep, there you were saying, uh, I forgot your name, sorry brother. Graham. Graham, yeah, you, Graham was saying before during morning tea that he's excited that we will be like Christ <laughs> then, <laughs> and that's where we're headed. But God's goal is for us, God's desire for us, when we get to the saved side of the cross, is not to stay stagnant and not to do Groundhog Day in the Christian life. His desire for us is to continue to press on to maturity. The New Testament is so clear about that. And so we need to keep pressing on. That takes prayer, takes commitment, takes the power of the Spirit, and it takes God's working together to see that happen. Are there any other questions at all? Okay, feel free to ask any as they uh, come up during our time together. Uh, you should see your, that sheet there that says workshop on page four. And we talked about this before. What, what might God do in and through the people of Mac if I'm praying, my friends are praying, the staff are praying, and the whole church is praying together? Now, this, this concept of prayer for two, I just want to um, outline a bit of, about what it can look like. How many people are in the church or here? There's about 100 here, 90, 100, something like that. In the room, in the room yep. Not, let's Let's say 100, yep. Um, that's what Brom, Don Bradman said, wasn't it? Let's say 100, not 99. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I've never been introduced by someone saying how much they hate cricket. That's the first time it's ever happened. Yeah. Okay, if we, if, we, if we start and we go, let's say Mac people, okay? And let's, let's say 100 is a hundred. Just say everybody did pray for two. Okay? There would be 200 people, 200 non-believers within driving distance of this church who would be being prayed for on a weekly basis by individually, ideally by two other friends. That's what we'd like to see happen is you praying and two other friends praying for your friends too. And then the whole church staff and everybody praying regularly for everybody's friends, not necessarily by name, but praying that prayer that Rob has prayed. There's 200 people. And so if the next step, and Rob's laid out some of these, I think, you know, through, through growth groups, small groups already, if the next step was just your friend meeting another friend, another Christian friend in the church, or two other Christian friends in the church, and let's say you had prayed for them for a few months, and you, or sorry, the next step is you just meeting up with them and wanting to see them take the next step. Okay, that might be just uh, praying for them. It could be catching up with them for coffee, watching something on television with them, doing some gardening, just as you go, doing something with that friend. Okay, it may just be one person over a month or two months that you touch base with once. <clears throat> that 200 people, let's say it goes down a bit, we can't get to see everybody, different things happen. We could be looking at maybe... I don't know, let's say 170 people with a, a next small step. We've been praying for them, okay? 
and let's say that happens a few times and then we connect them with our other friends, okay? And we invite them all, we invite them all 200 to come and have a, a bar barbecue or do something together, play tennis together, go for a walk together, whatever it might be that those people are interested in or they might be willing to come to. And we invite them all. We could maybe get, I don't know, uh, if you had a couple of them, maybe 140 people who come and, I hope you can see that, who come and do that, okay? And then... Oh, and then we invite them to something like... With my mic. Okay. He's, he's learning fast. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Okay, so that's, you know, meeting our friend or friends, Christian friends. Okay, and let's say the next step might just be coming to a whole church social event. Now, you might not necessarily work through all these this year as Mac, but you're just trying to, what you're trying to do is go from the individual to a couple of other Christian friends, so they're getting to meet your other Christian friends to the whole group, the gospel may not be on the agenda at all. They might not hear anything about Jesus at this point. To maybe a social event with the whole church, a trivia night or a, a barbecue or a picnic or something like that. Um, and let's say, you know, you had a hundred people come to, I'll, I'll write barbecue, picnic, trivia. And what we're trying to do is move, remember we talked before about engage, evangelise, on that side of the cross, establish and equip on the other side of the cross. We're trying to see those people who are in the engaged category meet people and take that next small step, whatever that might be. And as you keep coming through, it's possible, depending on how many steps you have, that you end up having evangelistic Sundays or evangelistic events that you're inviting people to. But the, the bridge to walking through that church door, which is intimidating for many people, uh, and a lot of people just have never been to church, like I was talking about my friend before. He would never have been in a church except for maybe a wedding or a funeral. But they've met Jim and they've met Bill and they've met John or Mary and Sue and Janet and they know them and they're willing to come. <clears throat> you could end up, having started with 200 people that you're praying for, you could end up having, who knows how many, who knows what God might do, how many people might come through the door to an evangelistic event or a couple of evangelistic Sundays or something like that. But you could realistically have, I don't know, 70 to 100 people. I'll put evangelistic event, evangelistic event. Okay, now God in his kindness, if we're praying and devoted to prayer, he may see all 200 come. We don't know. We don't know what God's going to do. But he, we know that he wants us to pray. We know that he wants all men to be saved. And we know that he wants to see them take the next small step. It's possible you could have any number of people. What would it be like to see 50, 70, 100 people? I think you're having those Sundays in August, but this is a cyclical thing that could be repeated again next year and the year after so that praying for two just becomes a, a part of the culture of Mac. It may be the same two that you're praying for next year. Well, God willing, they may be here with us and you start praying for, for another two. Who, who knows what will happen? But you could end up having that sort of many people coming through an evangelistic event if we're praying for 200 people. Does that make sense? Any, now, a lot of, some people might say, I don't know two people. I don't have two connections. Okay? What, what do we do in that situation if we don't have two people that we could pray for? Anyone got any thoughts? Or you're just so stretched. You're in that season of life where you just feel so busy or it's hard to get out of the house for health reasons or whatever it might be I don't know too but I don't know how I'm going to you could start by praying or you could pick one person there's a lot of different options we can talk more about that soon I heard during the week about what Mike has done to try and connect with the community so I'm going to ask you to come up mate You, you felt challenged by this yourself, and so you have... Tell them, take it away. Tell, tell everyone what you've been doing. Sure. Uh, okay, so uh, 
when we kind of the genesis of this idea, and I was like, ah, oh, so good, so enth- like, I, like enthusiasm shot through the roof, and then reality set in about five seconds later, <laughs> because I was like, I- I've lived here a year or a year and a bit with my wife and little boy, and I just was like, hang on, I don't have anyone. I just didn't have any, like we're talking about kind of regular connections, all that kind of stuff. I didn't have anyone. I really didn't. I had people who I would talk to, businesses, um, you know, I love my coffee, so I'd talk to local baristas, that kind of stuff, but nothing kind of ongoing. So when we started this a few months ago, I was like, whoa, I really don't have anyone. And so for me, I, I, I need structure. Uh, I need something to be regular uh, and kind of try and play to a strength of, well, I love to chat and I like to listen. Well, what, what place or where could I do that regularly? And so after about three months of praying, so what are we, March? Yeah, about three months now. Uh, as of just this week, so a few days ago, yeah, Thursday morning, I found a group uh, of blokes uh, that do a regular walk, and some of you guys might know it, called the Man Walk. Uh, it's a man walk which is it's kind of all over the country, but there's a particular point in Barrel where at 5.45 in the morning, uh, <laughs> it's early, uh, blokes, any blokes, uh, but it's kind of a regular, there's a regular bunch of blokes who meet ev- every Thursday morning to walk around sort of the Barrel area, it's a nice walk, that sort of stuff, and we just talk. We talk about anything and everything, as I found on the, you know, the Thursday morning. One guy who I'm now praying for, a guy called Michael, I just said, hey, my name's Mike, how are you going? 45 minutes later, it was like, wow, that was some big, intense kind of conversation. It was like life story sharing stuff. Uh, I didn't expect it. I wasn't sure what it would be like. Um, but it's, it's regular, it's weekly, it's in the Highlands. They're all kind of local blokes. And uh, I was really convicted by that and I was really encouraged that, again, I want to emphasise, I didn't have this three months ago until I started praying. I didn't. That is God's work, not my own, but committed to pray and God just revealed it. So thankful and we'll see what happens. Great. Thanks, Mike. Excellent. Thanks, mate. Yep, so it started with oh you go. It started with prayer as the foundation as asking God to, to lead and direct you. Five forty five may not be your thing, but maybe it is. <laughs> but that's a great example. A great example. Um, what we're, what we're not talking about is adding in two or three or a whole uh, big demanding weekly schedule. What we're trying to think about is a shift of mindset and a commitment to prayer and a planning to think, how could I touch base with one person in the next month? And how could I touch base with the other person the next month? You may be able to do both in that month if you've got time, great. But one person for once a month, if you can touch base with them, but definitely committing to praying and praying together. Okay, so Mike, ideally, will have a couple of friends who'll be praying with him for those guys in the man walk. Are there any questions about that at all, or any other questions on on the on the kind of prayer for two concept in terms of seeing people move forward? Yes, well, it's, it's, it's thinking particularly about people who are within driving distance to see them move forward, but, yep, you're saying there's people outside of the area that you, you want to pray for, great. Sure, sure. I mean, that, that's, that's a, a discussion, I guess, within your small group or... It's focused particularly on local. So are, are there people who we can reach who we, within our structures here, can help take the next step? That's, that's the main focus. Um, and so it, going outside that, yeah, we don't want to stop you praying, <laughs> praying for people. We don't want to stop you seeing people move forward outside the area, absolutely. But I guess talk with others, talk with, uh, with Mike and Rob and others about that. Do you want to say something about that? Yep. Uh, You're right, Zara, it is deliberately set to two people in our local area because if we're going to actually say we're going to invest in a real relationship, we're not after points here, we're after genuinely loving people getting involved in their lives, them in ours, so that they can hear and see the love and life of Jesus. You can't do that with Aunt Gertrude in Timbuktu. 
You can pray for her, you can talk to her, you can write to her, but in terms of uh, prayer for two, we're deliberately saying, now let's be involved as we're called to, to share not only our, the gospel, but our lives as well. So it's not limited to two, uh, but we are saying, let's seek to actually uh, invest locally in real relationships. Thanks, mate. Yep, to share Christ and, and to know Christ. Of course, from there, there might be a whole... Let's say people come through the door, those 1,700 come to those evangelistic events. Some, some may believe straight away. God can do that. God can answer your prayers in that way. Some may take six months. Some may take years. Some may completely reject it and never want to come back again. We don't know what God's going to do. Our job is to pray, to invite, to think carefully about what might be the best next step for people. Okay? And when they, they hit, it might be... A, from there, there could be all sorts of next steps, and that's what we're going we're gonna to work on and practice as a group now. If you see that next um, point two there, brainstorming next small steps. On the, on the uh, post, giant post-it notes you can see on the wall or on the tables in front of you, um, we're going to do a brainstorming exercise in groups, and there'll be a prize for the winning group. Okay, hope you like chocolate. Um, <laughs> In groups, first of all, I'll go through the, just clarify the engage, evangelise, establish bit again. When we talk about people in the engage category, we're talking about people who haven't necessarily shown any interest in Jesus in any way whatsoever. Okay, they may be hardened to it, they may be closed to it, or they may just not have it on the agenda. Okay, that's someone we're talking about being in the engage category, and the engage category is just touching base with them. Okay, the gospel's not explicitly on the agenda. We talk about them being in an evangelised category, and I understand it's a false delineation because we don't know when that's going to when that's going to shift from one to the other. That's someone who has maybe heard the gospel and is warm and open to hearing more. Okay, that's someone we classify as being in that evangelised category. The established category is when they have confessed and repented and believed and trusted Christ. Okay, and so they are established new believers and we've got to think about what's the best next step for them which comes further along here what we're going to do now you're going to write you're going to have one person in a group of say seven or eight going to the wall or to the tables and the first three here are engaged and i think there's three that are evangelized and i think there's three that are established new you've got to think and brainstorm as many possible things that you could pray for that person at that stage. Okay, what could you pray? Are there things in scripture you would pray? Are there other things you would pray? And it's just an exercise in getting the most things down on paper. Okay, so don't write the prayer point that's 100 words, just write two or three words for that particular thing. What are the things you would pray for someone in that category? And then below the line, I want you to think, what are possible next small steps? Keep in mind the talk we had this morning about how disciples are made. What, below the line, what are the possible next steps for someone in that category? There could be all sorts of things. We want to write as many as you possibly can, and I'm going to give you three minutes. I'll let you know when we're starting. Three minutes to write as many as you can. You're going to call out to your scribe and just say, write this, write this, write this, and see how many you can get down in, in, in I think I'll give you three minutes. Does that make sense? Do people understand what we're planning to do? Are we writing them on the wall now? Or are you're going to stand up in groups of about eight. So how are we going to organise this, Rob? <laughs> All right. I see some people already organising themselves. Good on them. Okay. If you're in the centre and you have a table either in front of you or behind you, then you turn and you're on that table. So, not you guys, don't look behind you, the table is in front of you. (laughs) Alright, so on the sides, every two rows, you're a pair. Alright, so the first two rows, if that doesn't make enough, you could go all three, that's fine. So, sort yourselves into kind of clumps of around up to eight, around a table or a post-it. Marianne, what's your question? Nice and loud. Oh, okay, so don't, oh. start, oh, don't start writing until and we'll let you know. We'll say go when it's time to start writing. There's no silly, silly uh, statement. Just write as much as you can. We'll let you know. If you're in the middle and nothing is written down, 
You can choose anyone, engage, evangelise or establish. Pick whichever one you want, what to pray and then what to write. Gather yourselves around the post-it, make sure you've got a marker and then I'll let you know when it's time to start. <coughs> yeah. No, we're not we're not writing yet. Don't start writing yet. Don't write yet. Oh, there's some people cheating. <laughs> we'll let you know when it's time to start. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Are we everyone okay? So those who have got one in the middle on the tables, just write which one you want. Whether work out which category you want to do, and then the top half is what we could pray for that person, and the bottom half is what could be a possible next step. Okay. Are we ready? Has anyone got a stopwatch? Three minutes you've got. Anyone, you know, got a question? Yep. Yes. So just, for, just one more time. If you're on a table here, write down which category you want to do, whether it's engage, evangelize, establish, pick one. The top half you're writing down things you could pray for a person at that point. The bottom half you're thinking about possible next steps outside of prayer. So what could you do in line with what we talked about this morning to see someone take a next small step? And just, it's an exercise in thinking of as many possible things as you can. Rob, on your marks, get set, go! You're thinking what, what, yeah, what to pray. What are things we could pray? Yep. So the prayer is what, what are the things we could pray for that person or for anyone in that category? Can you just pass that glass? Maybe? Thank you. Good on you. Thanks. Uh, or I'll give you I'll give you some extra time. Yep. Okay, because we're because we're so generous, we're gonna extend it by a minute. So you've got another minute.
Okay, we've got 30 seconds left. 30 seconds left. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, pens down. Well done, that's great. Thank you for doing that. Now, can I just have your attention? Oh, yep, yeah, got to stop. <laughs> this group's going to be excommunicated from your church next week for cheating. <laughs> okay. Well done. It's just a great exercise in thinking through what next steps possibly could be and what we could pray. Um, remember this morning we talked about the four Ps, prayer, proclamation, by God's people, persevering over time. So prayerful dependence on the Spirit, by God's people, proclaiming the Word over time. Apart from the prayer category at the, the top, could you just go through your list that's below the line and just work out, is it pro proclaiming the Word or is it something to do with God's people? Is it just modelling or spending time? Or is it a, an exercise in persevering over time? Which of those P's is it actually? Or it could be, it could be all three. Below the line and just list which category is it in. We know the top half is prayer. What's the bottom half? Just write proclaim or persevere or people next to those points below. Proclaim people perseverance. It could be all three. Mike, Mike. Okay, and now can you can you add up? Just add up now how many, how many prayer points you had and how many next steps you had. Just add the, t the combined total. How many, how many things did you brainstorm? Just add that and then write a number and circle it. Yeah, just write, yeah, just write down ideas, just like what people have written. So I'm just going to go through and hear some, hear some ideas. Is there a handheld I can use? Is there a handheld? At all? <laughs> Thanks, mate. Thank you. Okay. What we're going to do is just hear a bit from each group about some of the ideas they came up with. So we can just listen in. I just want you to say what category you had, what are some of the things you prayed for, and what are the, some of the next step ideas. Can we just bring the attention back, guys, just so we can get through this? That'd be great. So just sharing a couple of prayer points and a couple of next steps, and we'll just go around the room. You might share something different as you go through. So this group here, who wants to be the spokesperson? Georgia. Thank you, Georgia. Okay, tell me what Hello. you had. Which category did you have? We had Engage. Engage. We okay. had a, a great engaging session talking about Engage. 
Um, so some of our prayer points, we had um, praying for time, praying um, for vulnerability in sharing, praying to, for us to see the opportunities that we could take, um, praying for soft hearts for people that we talk great, to. Great, 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 great. No, that's excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Any, any Many others? more we Don't, had. Okay, what about, what about the possible next steps for people in that engaged category? What are some next steps? That next steps. Um, connecting could be via coffee, sports, cycling, walking, concerts, op shop trail, um, acts of service for the person, uh, meeting them where they're at, taking them to the brewery. Um, yeah. Great. Excellent. Like Thank you very stuff. much. That's great. We've got another group here. I'll grab the mic. Who's the spokesperson? Yep. Thank you. Another group with Engage. Did you have anything, okay. anything um, different to that? Uh, probably a lot. A lot of eyes open to notice opportunities. Um, opening to talk about Christian things, praying for that so that you got the opportunity to do that. Um, and looking for common ground, having the courage to talk and to form the friendships and listening to their, st their stories, not just talking about yourself um, and just being outside your box when you are relating to these people. They may not be like you. Excellent. Are they next steps or some next yep, steps? Yep, the next small steps were things like persevering by keep going, um, focusing on your time, keeping your time available, asking for coffee, follow-up activities, things of that nature. Uh, exchanging phone numbers, basic idea, you know, kind of making sure that there's continuing contact. Um, the substance of friendships is um, being together, so creating opportunities to be together and inviting to events and to meet your friends. That is terrific. Thank you. There's so many great ideas. What we're going to do, I'm going to give the staff a job, which they didn't know about, is we're going to assemble all these points, all these possible next steps, and, and we might put them in the four categories and then email out. These, these are some ideas for next steps, okay? Just so you can have a look at them later when you're trying to work out what's next. Who had evangelise? Over here. We might not get around to everybody, but we'll... This group was active. Do you want to go? What did you have to pray for people in the evangelise category? Okay. Um, Just two or three originally, things. we put salt and light that... Our saltiness will rub off onto them. Yes, great, great. Okay, and to that they will be open to hearing more, and for me, to, for them to hear the truth, the Holy Spirit to work in their lives, to be connected to other Christians, wisdom for us to talk through their questions, for them to welcome our friendship, for them to read and listen to God's word, and for them to be willing to hear our stories. Excellent. Thank you for that. That's great. Can you just pass it down to that group? What did you have for below the line for next steps in the evangelised category? Not enough because we ran out of time. <laughs> um, um, basically, most of it's been said already. Things like buy them a coffee, you know, set aside time intentionally to be able to spend with that person, um, to try and, you know, set an example in your own life of how you're living. Um, ask them questions and, again, you know, really listen to their answers and how you can follow up from that. And, um, yeah, that was really not much else for that. Thank you. One more group in the, in the evangelised category for next steps. Someone else have... Evangelise. Oh, where are they? Who else had evangelise? Just possible next steps. What's that? I can bring it to the front if you like. That's right. I'll bring. I'll, okay. <laughs> What did you have for next steps in evangelise? Next steps. Um, we, we've sort of put down a lot of what other people have put down, but engagement, um, praying, pray for them and um, pray for us too as we um, meet with them. Um, listening. I think that's um, something that's come across. We really need to listen 
um, accept their invitations, invite them to things. Um, and one thing um, else we put down was support. You know, offer, offer to do babysitting, um, have them for meals or even go and help them with the garden or something like that. And learning together and also just sharing with, whether it's the Bible together or um, sharing a podcast. Um, Excellent. Thank you. Someone over here just said if you want to do gardening, you can go over to their place. No, yeah. I, was, I was actually thinking of myself <laughs> then. <laughs> <laughs> just pass the mic for it. Thank you. So when, we're, when people are in the evangelised category, there's all sorts of things that we could do, isn't there? But remember we talked about, before, what the New Testament talks about it's the Word of God in prayerful dependence on the Spirit by His people over time. So how can we, we want to model and do all those things that we've heard from various groups. We want to see, can we get the word into their hands in some way? It could be speaking it. It could be inviting them to read something, just an article or something small. You, you need wisdom. You need prayer to know, is this the right time? You need boldness and courage. But we want to try and expose them to the word, if we can, in some way. Maybe an invite to church. Um, that's been you know your friend or family member, you know the situation they're in, you know the right time. So praying that God will give us wisdom about that. Just quickly, we might have one group with uh, Establish. Someone, is there a group with Establish? You guys over here, can I grab that? Thank you. Sorry for those we didn't get to hear from. So for someone who's new in the faith, what would you pray for them and what could be next steps for someone new in the faith? I might, uh, that's better. Uh, yes, yeah, so someone who's uh, established, so they they understand a little bit about Jesus, uh, to pray f- for them that they would know Christ better. Um, they would obviously grow in Christ from that. Uh, pray that they would become connected with the church and become and feel welcome to come to church. So no longer complete strangers to the church, but actually uh, become welcome at church. Uh, pray that they would build relationships with people at church so they would build relationships with other Christians. Um, pray that they would consider joining a growth group and hence be able to learn more about Christ and grow in that. And some next steps, that's excellent, thank you. What are next steps, steps, join a growth group. Okay, so answer to prayer there. Uh, encourage them to actually attend church and to try and come to church regularly. Um, encourage them to do partnership explored if they're starting to actually get interested and get into things and also encourage them if they've got kids or other family members to encourage the rest of their family to start getting involved as well in coming to church and things like that. Thank you so much, that's excellent. So with a new believer, we want to see them grounded in the basics, don't we? But we want pure spiritual milk, we want to see them firmly rooted and established and so the basics of the Christian life... How can we teach them how to read God's word for themselves and equip them to do that? Can we teach them how to pray? Can we teach them how to pray with one another? There's all sorts of gifts they may have, which also, you know, developed over time. But grounding them in the basics of the faith, growth groups can be a great place to do that. One-to-one Bible reading, reading a book, it's all sorts of word and prayer ministries to see people move forward um, in the Christian life. Now it comes, to, yes, sure. What's your, name? What's your name again? Sarah. Yes, it does. Sarah, Sarah, thank you so much for that. Absolutely spot on. So that, I think that comes under prayerful dependence on the Spirit and the prayer for spiritual protection. You are absolutely spot on. When, you, when a church like this engages in trying to reach the lost, Satan is not going to sit in his lounge chair and watch you carry on with trying to proclaim the, the word to the lost and see the people of the highlands one for Christ alive for Christ, of course he's going to fight. 
Ephesians 6 is one of the great prayers to pray, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yep. 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 That is so helpful. So they, they are things we definitely need to pray for and need to be a high priority, praying for spiritual protection. Thank you for that. Okay. We might... Please. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. We're in a spiritual war. Yep. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And we read that in the Great Commission as well. He's with us to the very end of the age as we go and make disciples. So he is with us. And that shield of protection, part of that shield of protection is the prayers of the saints. The one of the things that this sort of thing does is brings you together as one, as a team, all praying that you'll be moving in the same direction. We might come back to the competition because I just don't want to run out of time for this last exercise. Can you... Or actually, do you want to say... Yeah, we'll come, we'll come back. There's some really competitive people over here, but we'll do... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that at the end, okay, uh, and give out the prizes. Just see, you can see in your handout there, hopefully uh, you've got your handout. What I w- want you to do now, this is an action plan. Rob, have we got five minutes for them to go through this and then five minutes to pray? Is that okay? Yep. Okay, so I'll keep, I'll keep going. Is that okay? Uh, what I want you to do is think of, the, think of two people, um, at least get one done fully, and write down, I am praying for, and what's their name? Write their name in there. And then just go through these questions and write down your response next to it. And then I'm going to get you to pray with one other person. You're going to get you to tell them, tell them about the story of that person. We'll just do it for one person, okay? You can do the second one later. I want you to tell your friend who you're going to pray with about that person and their story and what you want them to pray for, and you're going to pray for each other's friend. Okay, I'll let you know when it's time to do that. So if you can just go through those questions. Yes, Rob? If you don't have someone, uh, uh, maybe come and see me and I'll have a chat with you. That'd be good. We can try and work it out together. Okay, so what... The questions here that you can see, how do I know them? What's the nature of their work, study, retirement? What are they doing during the week? Okay. What's their family situation? Are they married? Are they single? Are they widowed? Are they divorced? Have they got kids, empty nesters? What's their, their family situation? Family living a long way away. Do they have any history with Christianity? Any background? Are they strongly oppositional or do they seem kind of open to it? What category would you put them in? Remember, they're kind of artificial delineations aren't they engage and evangelize but where would you put them what are they like what are they interested in what are the challenges and i think one of the important ones is what do you see as the obstacle a major obstacle so we heard zara talk about what satan might do but is there anything that you are aware of so sometimes it can be a spouse who's strongly oppositional or busyness or hurt whatever you think is the obstacle take some time to write that down now at the end you need to write down are you going to are you going to pray for two or at least pray for one preferably pray for two and when will you do it and what do you need to do to make that happen so is it 5 minutes less of tv or social media or getting up 5 minutes earlier or how are you going to make this happen okay take some time to do that now come and see me if you want to chat we've got some questions not working again
just give you a couple more minutes just to fill out that section and then we might pray. Okay, can I, um, with the second person, you can fill that out later, can I encourage you just to uh, find someone to pray with, um, just quietly, and just pray, introduce them to that person, in a sense, the person that you've just written down, you've talked about, let them know who they are, do that for each other, and then pray for each other's friend. Okay, and pray for prayer for two in general, just just in pairs. I think twos or threes. Or oh, twos actually, because it'll take take too long with three. But just in pairs. Can I also say, if this is still something that you're wrestling with or feeling uncomfortable with, or you are just thinking, I don't have the time, or I really don't know who I would try and connect with. If that's you, can I encourage you to talk to either your growth group leader? or talk to Mike or talk to Rob to help them help you think it through, what it might look like in your context. We've all got different contexts. We're all at different stages and seasons of life. So there may be things that, that I, we uh, haven't considered yet, and they'd, they would love to help you, I'm sure. Okay? So don't sit silently, talk to someone, see, see if there's a way of, of moving this forward. But just pr find someone now. We're just going to take a couple of minutes just to explain the story of this person to each other and then to pray, and then we'll wrap it up. Sound okay? Great.
Can I encourage you just to start praying for each other's friend now? If you haven't start, started praying, just, just spend a couple of minutes praying and then we'll wrap up and go to lunch. Ring the bell. <laughs> It'd be handy, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be handy? Oh, no, no, no. Does win. Need me now, I'll take no. twenty seconds to finish. Okay. Now, just as you wrap up your praying in your pairs or triplets, I'm very confident uh, that that will have been an encouraging time for you, whether you had one, two, or just spending that time asking God to lead you uh, to, to these people. Um, you know, that's why we have our banner over here, God will show us who, let's ask him to lead us. Now... As I said earlier, we're going to come to a time now where we're going to, if you're willing, commit yourself to praying for two. And as we've been talking about today, uh, th there's a real spectrum there. It might be that you're down at that end going, I, I don't have anyone. That's okay. You can be committing that God would lead you to two. You can pray this prayer. It might be that you already have 20. Praise the Lord. Share them around. Um, quite deliberately, I mean, actually invite other people to get to know some of these people. Uh, but in a sense, this is a prayer that I think um, when we've got a heart to see people made alive with Christ, uh, I think we can pray this prayer and I think it's going to be really exciting to see God at work um, in us, in our prayers, through us and yes, even overcoming many of the obstacles uh, but also seeing new opportunities. So uh, the prayer is going to be up here on the screen and I'd encourage you, uh, if you feel that you can make this commitment to God, to pray it. If not, that's okay. Just keep praying, asking God to get you to that place. Uh, it'll be in the Mac News uh, next week so that we don't sort of forget it. Uh, but uh, okay. If you're going to pray, let's uh, pray together out loud. 
God of grace, help us to trust the power of the gospel to save anyone. May your saving power be made known among the nations. We pray that many people in the highlands will be made alive with Christ. Lead each of us to two people we can share our lives with and the love and life of Christ. We commit to praying regularly for two people to be made alive with Christ. We commit to pray for each other and for everyone's two people. In the name of Jesus, our Saviour, Amen. We're going to sing our final song. So whatever happens, to God be the glory. Let's stand and give him glory. to do.